Good afternoon, students. So we're going to start today the week seven prep. So this is going to be your last quiz for this semester. So today we're going to go over sentence structure. So how are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing good. I mean, not that good. I got a test last yesterday that didn't do that good. <laughs> so, so a test in what subject? Oh, no, don't, don't so, yeah. tell me. Don't tell me. This is, this is going to be on YouTube, so you can't really talk about all your tests and grades and stuff like that. So okay. anyway, so um, how, <coughs> excuse me, how are you doing otherwise? I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, doing good. Went to the VA, got some stuff down. That's good. That's good. That's good. Kelly, how are you doing? I'm okay. <laughs> That's just, good. So we can't talk about grades or anything here, but just how you're doing and all that kind of stuff. So are you looking forward to the very last quiz in this class? Yes. <laughs> so uh, what do you know about sentence structure? Not much. <laughs> okay. What about you, Kelly? What do you know about sentence structure? Do you, I, I think my screen is frozen. <laughs> Okay, all right, so your screen is frozen, so that's how she, that's actually a simple sentence. Your screen is frozen. S <laughs> subject, uh, at verb, and adjective. Subject, verb, and adjective. How are you doing today, Sarah? So I was just asking other st other students what they know about, oh, she's still connecting to her audio. So, uh, yeah, so, so this is going to be the last quiz, and I'm going to go over, I'm going to go over the different kinds of sentences in English. And so there are three kinds of sentences in English. You have your simple sentence, you have your compound sentence, and you have your complex sentence. And then if you know your sentence structure, then you're able to avoid sentence fragments. And so that's for, for your writing, that's really important. We're also going to go over how to use comma usage in sentence structure. So without further ado, I will go over, let's see, share my screen. And here goes the everything. Okay, so week seven uh, quiz. We're going to go over the week seven grammar concepts. We're going to go over the week seven practice quiz. And we're going to be doing the introduction to the comparison contrast essay, which is also going to be the last essay you're going to do. And so when we do the comparison contrast essay, remember the numbers 7, 8, 11, 12. Those are the four weeks you're going to be working on the comparison essay, uh, comparison contrast essay. So I will repeat that again. Seven, week seven, week eight, week 11, and week 12. So during those weeks, week seven and eight, week seven, we're going to do the pre-writing. Week eight, we're going to do the rough draft. And then week 11 and 12, we're going to do re revising, as in re rewriting. So that's 7, 8, 11, 12. 9 and 10 are two different, are totally different. So let's start with our sentence structure um, <clears throat> unit. So sentences can be joined together by either a coordinating conjunction, subordinating conjunction, or a transition word. All of the following sentences are joined by different conjunctions. If the conjunction is a subordinating conjunction, then the sentence becomes a dependent clause and you need another sentence to complete the thought. These are known as complex sentences. If the sentences are joined by coordinating conjunctions, then you have a compound sentence. So you need to learn the difference between these conjunctions to avoid sentence fragments. In student essays, I'm always commenting to students that they need to learn sentence structure to avoid sentence fragments. And I've said this thousands of times. And so in English, you have three basic sentence types. You have the simple sentence, the compound sentence, and the complex sentence. And you also have compound complex sentence, in, which, in other words, when you combine the compound sentence and the complex sentence into one sentence, then that fourth kind, which I'm going to cover in week 12, it's not going to be on your quiz, but it's, it's, it's the fourth kind, it's compound complex sentence. And so here I'm going to go over some of these sentences, see if you know what sentence is which. John was fat. <clears throat> is that a simple compound or complex sentence? John was fat. Simple compound? Yes, sentence? It's, it's, it's simple, yeah. Just, just like uh, uh, her screen was frozen. 
Oh, Kelly's screen was frozen. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a simple sentence. Mary was thin. So this has a subject, it has a verb, and it has an adjective. Now if I com combine these two simple sentences together with a coordinating conjunction, fanboys, uh, for, and, but, or, and, or, so, yet, and I combine it together, combine it together into one sentence, then that's known as a compound sentence. A compound sentence simply means, count the word compound simply means two sentences. Compound subjects mean two subjects. Compound verbs mean two verbs. So whenever an, an a compounded problem means two problems or double the, double the problem. So anything to do with compound means double. And so here, whenever you have a coordinating conjunction, you always need a, a comma before the coordinating conjunction. John was fat, yet Mary was thin. So this is also a coordinating conjunction. And you can remember that something is coordinating conjunction is by fanboys. So this is the Y in fanboys. Although John was fat, Mary was thin. What kind of sentence is that? A simple, is that a compound, or is that a complex sentence? Sarah? Complex. Complex. Why is this a complex sentence? Because it has although at the first, so it's, um... I'm not sure exactly how to describe it, but it's, it's kind of comparing the two. Like, he, even though he was fat, although he was fat, she was thin. Yes, so you're comparing the two. So um, when you have a compound sentence, John was fat, yet Mary was thin, both these sentences have equal significance. And then yet, when we have a comp complex sentence, Although John was fat is a dependent clause, so that it's less important than the independent clause, Mary was thin. So if I combine a dependent clause together with an independent clause, that makes a complex sentence. And then if the dependent clause is at the beginning of the sentence, you have a comma. Mary was thin, even though John was fat. Is this a Simple, compound, or complex sentence, Kelly? Compound? It's a compound sentence. Why is it a compound? No, it's not a compound sentence. Sorry. It's not a compound sentence. Is it complex then? It's a complex sentence. Why is it a complex sentence? I guess from the even though? Yeah. So what is the even though due to the sentence John was fat? It's comparing yeah, but what is it, how does it change the sentence, John was fat? Sarah mentioned it earlier with although. So even though is a subordinating conjunction. And so although, even though, whenever you have a subordinating conjunction in front of an independent clause, then the subordinating conjunction renders that independent clause a dependent clause. And so whenever you have a, a, a dependent clause, can a dependent clause stand alone? A dependent? No. No. Independent can. An independent can. Why can't a dependent clause stand alone? Uh, it doesn't need any, it doesn't need a comparison. Uh, why can't, why can't a dependent clause be, be by itself? Because it's dependent. Because it's dependent and because it's not a complete thought. Excellent. So if I just simply say, even though John was fat, that is not a complete sentence. That is a dependent clause and that's also known as a sentence fragment. And so if I said, especially John is big, is that a dependent or an independent clause? Independent. Especially, independent. especially John was fat. Ah, that's a dependent clause, yes, because especially is, well, anyway, so whenever you have a subordinating conjunction and then, oh, and so here, the dependent clause is at the end of the sentence, so if the dependent clause is at the end of the sentence, no commas. So if the dependent clause is at the beginning of the sentence, although John was fat, you need a comma, but if the dependent clause is at the end of the sentence, no comma. John was fat whereas Mary was thin. Is this a um, compound or complex sentence? Mm. Uh, 
compound. Yeah. Yes, that's very good. Yeah, this is a compound sentence because this is a transition word. Okay, so how, why is this not correctly? Um, with, it does not have correct pu punctuation. How would I correctly punctuate a um, transition word? Uh -huh. Semicolon, and then uh -huh. and then what do I put after the transition word? Look at how however is done. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So whenever uh -huh. you have a transition, when you have a transition word, then you have to have a semicolon, and then you have to have a comma. John was fat. Nevertheless, Mary was thin. So because you can see that there's a semicolon and a comma, you know that this is what kind of sentence? Uh, compound. Compound sentence. And so here you have John was fat is an independent clause. Mary was thin. It's also an independent clause. And it's joined together by a transition word, but also known as a conjunctive adverb. Okay? And so as a writer, if you want to write a sentence where you want to say, although John was fat, Mary was thin, and you want to compare the two, then you, and you want to say this really fast, then you would use a complex sentence. If you want the reader to read, John was fat, yet Mary was thin, then you're going to use a compound sentence. So this help, helps you know, having knowing sentence structure helps you have like writer's style. In other words, the style of writing. Do you want the reader to read it fast or do you want the reader to, to read it evenly and slow? And so this oh. adds to the style of whatever you're writing because here, although John was fat, is not as important as the fact that and Mary was thin. Although John was fat, but Mary's thin, you know. Here you have John was fat, yet Mary was thin. In other words, both sentences have equal uh, importance. And so it depends on you, the writer, when you write your essay, which kind or what you want, how your readers to read that sentence. So um, what is the difference between a subordinating conjunction, a coordinating conjunction, conjunction and a transition word? Anybody want to volunteer that one? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Whether it's a compound, complex, or yes, very good. So here, if you have a subordinating, subordinating as in something that's below or inferior, so that's like the dependent clause. That's how you know it's subordinating conjunction. A coordinating conjunction means it coordinates two equal sentences. That becomes fanboys. And then a transition word just simply means that you're transitioning two equal sentences and you're transitioning from one equal sentence to another equal sentence. So that's why we use transition words. Some, we only use three transition words per paragraph. We don't need a transition word after every single paragraph. But two or three transition words per paragraph makes that flow of your essay sound better. So that's basically it. All right, so let's go over simple sentence, subject, plus verb, plus object. A, sen a simple sentence is a complete thought, and it's also known as an independent clause. So here are some examples. Jack, subject, gets, verb, adjective, and uh, object. So subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object. All of these have subject, verb, object. The only the only thing that makes it com confusing for people is when I have something like Steve loses rarely at the casinos. Now at the casinos is a prepositional phrase because a prepositional phrase shows time and place. So at the table, on the table, under the table, at five o'clock. So I could also rewrite this at the casinos Steve rarely loses and this is also a I'm not a compound sentence. This is also a simple sentence. It has the same meaning at the casino, Steve rarely loses, has the same meaning as Steve rarely loses at the um, casinos. All right. Mary likes to dress up. Dress up is an infinitive to dress up. Sorry, likes to dress up. To dress up is an infinitive phrase because you have an infinitive to dress. Uh, and a phrase means it's is a group of words with no subject and no verb, whereas a clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. Okay, so you got to know the difference between a clause and a phrase. 
Here's some more, here's a bunch more of uh, simple sentences. Robert eats steak. Robert likes to dance. Up the hill sits an old house. So up the hill is a prepositional phrase. Sits is the verb and house is the subject. Here you have the subject coming after the verb. And up the hill sits an old house has the same meaning as the old house sits up the hill. Subject, verb, prepositional phrase. Down the street is the police station. Down the street is the prepositional phrase. Is is the verb and the police station is the subject. So the simple, the, the singular subject, police station, takes the singular verb is. The police station and has the same meaning. Down the street is the police station, has the same meaning as the police station is down the street. And then to review, an independent clause is a complete sentence and a complete thought, and a dependent clause is an, in, is an incomplete sentence and a sentence fragment. And so what is the difference between a phrase and a clause? Uh, Kelly. You're on mute. My, My answer, answer was more, more intelligent, intelligent on mute. <laughs> um, what's, what's the, the difference, difference between, between a phrase, phrase and a clause? Mm -hmm. a, a phrase is more of a fluid statement. statement. A clause would have like a semicolon, semicolon or something, right? right? No, no. So anybody can help her with this? Mm -hmm. Sam, what is the difference between a phrase and a clause? Would, Would a phrase be a same and clause be a statement? statement? So can anybody help Sam and Kelly? Sarah? <laughs> How, How about you? you? <laughs> uh, not quite sure. Um, um, yeah, so a clause is a, is, is a group of words with a subject and a verb. A phrase mm -hmm. is a group of words with no subject and no verb. That's why we say a prepositional phrase down the street, uh, at, under the table. There's no subject, there's no verb. It, so that makes it a phrase. Uh, a, a clause is something with a subject and a verb. So that, that could be either a dependent clause or an independent clause. So a dependent clause would have a subordinating conjunction plus a, a sentence, and an independent clause is a complete thought and would be a complete sentence. And, and they both have, and they are both, a um, group of words with a subject and a verb. So what are two kinds of, two groups of words, no, two groups of words, yeah, that have a subject and a verb? What are two kinds of clauses? Independent. Independent and dependent. And so now we're going to move on to compound sentences. A compound sentence has fanboys, for and nor, but or yet so. Fanboys are coordinating conjunctions that join two sentences together. A coordinating conjunction joins two simple sentences together to form a compound sentence. So here, all of these are all compound sentences, oh, except, for the, except for the first one. John and Mary ate and slept. Here you don't have a compound sentence. Instead, you have a simple sentence that has a compound subject and a compound verb. Because John and Mary, that's, two, that's, that's like two subjects, ate and slept, two verbs. So when you have two subjects, it's known as a compound subject. And then when you have two verbs, it is a compound verb. Why is the first sentence not a compound uh, sentence? Why is it that a simple sentence, even though it seems to have compound everything else? It does. It has two ends in it. How come it's got no comma? Well, that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, it's because it's got no comma. In other words, it doesn't separate two different sentences. So John and Mary ate and slept simply is a simple sentence that's subject, verb, subject, verb. So instead, you want John ate steak but Mary ate salad. So here you have fanboys and you always have a uh, comma before but or fanboys. 
John slept in a bed, but Mary slept on the floor. John gets good grades. Four, he studies hard. Not many students know that four means because. That's another way of saying because. So John gets good grades because he studies hard. If I'm from England or from Britain, which is the same country, this is very common in British English, okay? American English, not so much. Do you hear people talking like this? John gets good grades for he studies hard? Do you hear people yeah. talk like that? I don't hear people talk like it, I'll read it. Yes, in, in old books and in, in New England, okay? So let's say you're in Boston or something like that, you might hear people talking like this. But outside of New England and the rest of the country, this is in Britain. So, so, so New England still has a little bit of, very little, but very little of British English. John is tall, but Mary is short. Steve gambles all the time, yet he loses rarely at the casinos. Mary likes to dress up so she can feel good about herself. Robert eats steak and he likes to dance. Usually Mr. Smith goes to the park or he goes to the beach to take his walks. So in all of these cases, you have a comma in front of fanboys. And then here you have, yeah. So like in the, the sentence where it says Robert eats steak and he likes to dance, if it just said Robert eats steak and dances, that yeah. would be a compound sentence, right? So if I say Robert eats steak, uh, let's see, and likes to dance, I forget, oh, and likes to dance. Okay, if I take out the he, then this becomes Oh, okay, let me let me ask you that. If I take out the he, does is this still a compound sentence, or is this a, a subject, a singular subject with a double with a compound verb or a predicate? Mm -hmm. Likes. Oh, okay. Here, let me let me make this. Robert likes to eat. All right. Robert likes to eat steak and likes to dance. So what kind of sentence is this? If I take out the, the he? It's, so is it a simple sentence? It's a simple sentence, correct. So this is simple sentence because this is a compound, what do we call it? Compound, actually it's more like compound predicate. A predicate. Oh, I dropped my, dropped my, I dropped my uh, mouse. Isn't that annoying? And now, mm -hmm. now, now it won't, now it won't, uh, yeah. So here you have a compound predicate, okay? Compound predicate, a predicate means it's everything that comes after the verb, okay? So this is similar to a compound verb. So anything that comes after the verb is it. So this is a simple sentence. So I simply changed it just so that you understand that when you have a compound sentence, you have, um, Two, set and two, two independent clauses separated by fanboys. And this does not have any for, or, and, bore. And no, there's no fanboys and no commas in there. So that makes it a simple sentence. So uh, does everybody get that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So here are some transition words. In other words, these are other ways of writing a compound sentence. And uh, in many grammar books, some grammar books call these uh, transition words and other grammar books call them conjunctive adverbs. So it depends on what grammar book you're using. And so when we use, so there are different ways. When we use transition words, transition words of opposition, okay, transition words of opposition are different ways of saying but. Transition words of cause and effect transition words of, well, I'm just going to say causation, cause, cause and effect, that's different ways of saying because, 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 because. Do I have any and? Yeah. And transition words of, of the different ways of saying and are transition words of addition. The reason why you're learning all of these names is so that you, when you go to Google and you Google um, trend, the word transition words list, it's going to have these different categories. So that way, when you write your essay, you don't give me but, 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 or you don't give me because, 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 and you don't give me and, 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 and. Instead, you're going to use different transition words of opposition, different transition words of causation, 
and different transition words of addition, such as you would say, moreover, furthermore, in addition, and you don't keep saying and, 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 and. Okay, so that's, the, that's what transition words are for, are different ways of saying fanboys. So here, okay, transition words of contrast. See, that's what I say. Different, different books are going to have, sometimes they call this uh, cr contrastive transition words. Okay, transition words of contrast. But you, you get the idea. I mean, contrastive or contrastive conjunctive adverbs. Yeah, I've, I've heard it said that. Contrastive conjunctive conjunctive adverbs. Although transition words of opposition, all of that just means different ways of saying but. So, John, unlike John, Mary is fat. Is that a simple sentence or a compound sentence? It depends on how I did it. Um, Un it wouldn't be a complex sentence because it's before. Well, it all depends on. I'll write it out. Never mind. So, all you have to know is all of these are different ways of saying but. Addition is all the, all the different ways of saying and. Emphasis also are different ways of saying Let's see, it's a different ways of saying um, then, it's different ways of saying so. Oh, okay. Okay, so here you have uh, transition words of, I forget, I think it's consequence. In other words, because, uh, then, um, therefore, things that show time, okay? One thing happens, then another thing happens, then another thing happens, therefore, and that sort of thing. So I had to look this one up. but. These are all different ways of saying so, different ways of saying but, different ways of saying because. Now, during my week eight uh, lesson, I will go over in extreme detail this, this particular lesson on transition words. This I just want to mention. Okay, and then the third kind of um, sentence is the subordinating, uh, is the complex sentence, which has a subordinating conjunction plus dependent clause plus independent clause. Now, other names for dependent clauses are adjective clauses, noun clauses, subordinating clauses, sentence fragments, incomplete thoughts, incomplete sentences, and adverb clauses. Okay, those are all those are all the different names for dependent clauses that you're going to find. Oh, there's more, but uh, those are the ones that can come off the top of my head. Um, but actually, there's a lot more. I left, I left out a whole bunch, but okay, whatever. So those are the different kinds of dependent clauses. And so here when you have, um, you can have adverb clauses of time, adverbial clauses of, of opposition. Oh, I could have put them up here. Anyway, what that means is that when you have uh, a dependent clause that shows time, okay, that's what adverbial clauses of, of uh, time means. Like, after I take a shower, um, I uh, put on my outfit or something like that. So that's an adverbial clause of time. Uh, although John is fat, Mary is thin, that's an adverbial clause of opposition because it shows different kinds of but. And so all of these are subordinating conjunctions that, sh that start a, a dependent clause. And if you use any of these words in front of, in, in front of an independent clause, it automatically turns that independent clause into a dependent clause. And so if I say John is fat, that stands alone. That's an independent clause. But if I add the word after or although John is fat, suddenly that becomes a dependent clause. And then you need another independent clause after the dependent clause in order to have one complete sentence. So when you combine a dependent clause with the independent clause, then it becomes a complex sentence. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it didn't make sense, then I have to redo some of this over again. <laughs> so another way of remembering this would be A, 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 A. So you have although, <laughs> as, and I forgot what the, the other A stands for. Um, and then W, W would be a where, whereas, wherever. You would be um, unless. And then B would be, see, I don't have because and before. I would be if, and S would be since. So you can remember it that way. Uh, another way of remembering what is, uh, what is what are subordinating conjunctions. So this will help you avoid sentence fragments 
and help you know where to place your commas and periods to avoid sentence fragments. Here I wrote it down. A-A-A-A-W-W-U-B-B-I-S. And then after, although, as. W-W is when and while. U is until. B-B is because and before. And then I stands for if and since. And so uh, A-A-W-W-U, in other words, subordinating conjunctions or adverb clauses start sentences that cannot stand by themselves as there are dependent clauses and they need another sentence to complete them. So A-A-A-W-W-U-B-B-I-S. Can you remember? So what are the, what's the three A-A-A's? Uh, although, after, and... Sorry, I'm trying to do my memory. As? Yes. And what are the two W's, Sarah? When, when and while. while. Okay, and what's B-B-I-S, Kelly? You are muted. Because, because before, before, if, and then since. Yes, yeah, so this is, that's a way of remembering, you know, the A-A-B-B-U-S. And so um, here are some examples. After the gold rush, as the world turns, since I don't have you, when a man loves a woman, and so by knowing that A-A-U-U-B-S makes for great titles, that is a great way to also remember that they are also sentence fragments that need another sentence to complete them. So if you can remember that A-A-W-W-U-B-B-I-S are used in movie titles and used in book titles, then you know that it is a sentence fragment. So um, here you have some more examples of complex sentences. Although John is fat, comma, he eats very little. As soon as the alarm clock rings, Steve jumps out of his bed. As long as I study hard, comma, I get good grades. Because Michael Jordan is tall, comma, he plays great basketball. Before I go to bed, comma, I brush my teeth. If I avoid people, sick people, I can catch fewer colds. And then here, and once I get my driver's license, I will buy my own car. Rather than spend a lot of money on clothes, I like to make my own clothes. Since I lost my husband, comma, I have to get a job. So you notice that in all of these cases, when you have a dependent clause at the beginning of the sentence, then you have comma, 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 comma. And then if the dependent clause is at the end of the sentence, then you don't have a comma. John goes to bed after he eats dinner. He eats very little, although he is fat. Steve jumps out of bed as soon as the alarm clock rings. I can get good grades as long as I study hard. Michael Jordan plays great basketball because he is tall. I brush my teeth before I go to bed. I can catch fewer colds if I avoid sick people. And so sentence fragment. After John eats dinner, not a complete thought. A complete sentence. After John eats dinner, he goes to bed. So for all of these um, A, 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 U, 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 B, B, I, S, subordinating conjunctions, then, then you have, this is the rule. The comma goes when the dependent clause is at the beginning of the sentence, and then when it's at the end of the sentence, then no, no comma. Then it changes. As soon as you have an adjective clause and a relative clause, who, whom, whose, which, that, then the rules change. Then if a who clause or a whom or whose or which clause is at the beginning of the sentence, you have two commas. And if it comes at the end of the sentence, you have one comma. And so for adjective clauses, that's because adjective clauses modify is a whole clause that modifies the noun. So for example, so, so here, I love the table that is made of wood. So that is made of wood modifies table. And since that is made of wood, comes at the end of the sentence, we use one comma. John is French. John lives in Paris. Why should we have John and John and John? So if you have two sentences with the same subject, you can combine those two sentences together, and you would end up with John, who is French, lives in Paris. So when you use a who clause, which is an adjective clause, because who is French modifies John, and you use it when you have two subjects that are the same after two, so that way you can combine two simple sentences together. 
then you have to have two, uh, two uh, commas. I do remember doing this before with a cactus that has high prices that gets stolen. Do you remember that from a previous something or other? Somebody yeah. moving into a dorm, and I forgot what, what, what that was. Something about living oh, in a dorm. Oh, into a dorm, and then a year, year later, later her family, family helped her or something like that. Exactly, yeah. It's the same idea, except this is with an adjective clause. And so when you have a who, whom, whose, which, that, then you have to have two, two commas, that because it's the it's an adjective clause that modifies uh, a noun, so it's an a positive. Then when it comes at the when who who who's which that comes at the end of the sentence, then it is uh, only one comma. So you got to remember two commas and one comma. So I do remember going through this before. So two what, reasons. Yes. What's, what's the a positive? positive? Oh, well, it's another way of saying it's another it's another way of saying adjective clause. Oh. oh okay. Okay. So it's just different books have different ways because some books call it an adjective clause some books call it a relative clause and some books call it an a positive grammar books I mean so you're gonna have different grammar books uh, talking saying the same thing so that when you um, when you look it up also another one is non-restrictive and restrictive adjective clauses meaning that if the if the if the clause is not important to the sentence then we use commas if it is important to the sentence, we don't use any comma. But that's not covered as much in your grammar. I'm going to go over that when I uh, do my extra grammar. Because this, what, what you're studying for the grammar test is just a um, shortened version of grammar. It doesn't cover all of English grammar. It just covers the basics of English grammar. And I think when I finish doing my grammar videos, that will cover all of English grammar. That's why it takes so long for me to finish those grammar videos. All right, so to repeat, so a simple sentence is John eats dinner. You have subject, verb, object, and IC stands for independent clause. A compound sentence, uh, John eats dinner and he likes steak. And so here you have an independent clause, a, com a coordinating conjunction, and an independent clause. And then a complex sentence is a dependent clause plus an independent clause. And then the dependent clause is a subordinating conjunction plus an independent clause plus an independent clause and so that becomes a complex sentence although John eats dinner late he likes he still likes to eat steak so that's a complex sentence so in a nutshell you have three kinds of sentences in English you have simple compound and complex now we now now, now the sentences in blue are what you're going to see on your quiz if you aren't going to make it please call so that is a correct sentence. It's a correct complex sentence because here you have, if you aren't going to make it, it's a dependent clause. Please call is an independent clause, but it is an imperative sentence. Uh, it's an imperative, because there are different kinds of simple sentences. So that's what I mean is I don't cover all sentence types. Uh, for example, you have different kinds of simple sentences. You have the imperative simple sentence. You have a declarative simple sentence, and you have an interrogative simple sentence. And the reason why I don't bombard you with different kinds of simple sentences is that your brain can only take in so much grammar at a time. So anyway, so all you have to know is that here you have a dependent clause and you have an independent clause. You put them together, and it's a correct complex sentence. Notice how I've simplified it for you. So it takes skill to call in sick to work with a phony excuse. This is a simple sentence. It is a vague subject. It takes skill to call in sick to work with a phony excuse. Well, that whole thing is known as a predicate. So, so that's subject and verb. So that is a simple sentence. So that is correct, simple sentence. First of all, one must be sure to speak correct directly to the boss. So one is the subject and must be sure to speak directly to the boss is a verb predicate. So you have a subject and a verb. That's a simple sentence. Today I will be making appointments on the phone. So that's a simple sentence. We're going to go over why these are correct and incorrect and when we go over the difference between a dangling modifier and, um, and, and a, um, a kind of modifier that you got to move it. When I was four, my father taught me how to ride a bike. And so when I was four, this is a dependent clause, my father taught me how to ride a bike. This is correct. Why is this sentence incorrect? 
At the age of four, my father taught me to ride a bike. Why is that incorrect? I'm not, I'm not sure why it's incorrect, but it's like, like if we moved around, around my father taught me to ride a bike at the age of four, would that be correct? My father taught me to ride a bike. So your bike was at the age of four? No, but you got the right idea. Uh huh. So yes, it's, it's, it's some kind of dangling modifier, modifier mistake. So at the age of four, whenever you modify something, the, the clause, the, the phrase has to be right next to the noun that it modifies. So here it's wrong because your, your father was not four years old when he taught you to ride a bike. So that makes this a, a modifier, dangling modifier mistake. And this is correct. At the age of four, I learned to ride a bike. Why? Because at the age of four modifies a I. So this is known as an adjective phrase. So the adjective phrase, which is also a prepositional phrase, modifies the noun I. So here you have to have the correct noun Otherwise, it becomes a dangling model. I'm going to go over that in a second. Okay, so that, 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 will, that will be another lesson later on today. I could tell the room had been dusted, for all the pictures were crooked. So this is a compound sentence. Uh, it's used in the British because, because and it has the uh, comma before the uh, fanboy. So this is correct. We ate dinner, but we are still hungry. That's correct. Don studied hard, so he received a good grade. So that is a compound sentence, and that's correct. So now we're going to talk about modifiers and dangling, the difference between a dangling modifier and a misplaced modifier. Okay, that's what we were talking about with at the age of four, my father taught me to ride a bike. Why is that wrong? And so I'm going to go over why that's wrong uh, in this particular section of the lesson. So what are, yes? What is, what is, what is fanboys? fanboys? Why do you keep having, having that on there? Oh, fanboys. Uh, Sarah, what is, or Sam, either one, what is fanboys? Uh, uh, when you put four and no more. Yeah. Uh, uh, F stands for four, uh, A stands for and, uh, N stands for nor, B stands uh, for but, and O or, stands for or, and what does yeah, yeah. Y stand for? Yet. 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 And what does S stand for? Oh. oh. Excellent. And these are all used with what kind of sentence? Uh, compound sentences. Compound sentences, yes. And what about the A, A, B, W, W, I, W, W, I, S? What kind of sentences are those used with? Uh, uh, complex one. Complex sentence. Yeah, you can tell I don't know those as well as I know. I got, it out, I got that recently out of a grammar book saying, this will really help students learn uh, how to, your, your, but I think it'll help you more than it helps me since since uh, I learned fanboys much earlier than I learned A A W W B Y I S. It's too long. But anyway, so what are modifiers? So does that answer your question about fanboys? Okay. Yeah, yeah I, did, I, I didn't, didn't catch that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Do you understand about the compound and complex and all that stuff? I forgot to stop and ask. Everybody good? Do I need to go over it again? No. no, okay. So this is the last part of today's lesson. So what are modifiers? Modifiers are words that provide details and descriptions about the object. And so here, blue is a, modif is a modifier that describes the shirt adjective, okay? So blue shirt. And so a modifier is an adjective clause or is a word or it's a phrase that describes the noun. Does that make sense? It modifies something, mm -hmm. yes. So a dangling modifier occurs when a modifier, oh, and then you gotta know true or false. Do modifiers provide details and descriptions about the object? Okay, that's something, yeah. that, that'll be on your quiz. It's, it's gonna be true or false. Anyway, so getting back to dangling modif, no. Da so a dangling modifier is when the modifier is missing in the sentence. So here you have visiting the zoo, the birds chirp loudly. So remember that the, whatever it is, this is the modifier, and it has to have modified the noun, whatever noun has to be right here, okay? Always the noun and whatever the modifier is has to be together. So this one is missing. So did the bird suddenly grow legs and go visit the zoo in their car? No. 
So visiting the zoo, so it should be while I was visiting the zoo, the birds chirped loudly. So this is known as a dangling modifier because you're left dangling to know what's the subject of the sentence. It's, and so that makes the sentence incorrect and it also makes the sentence a sentence fragment. Walking on the sidewalk, a car, oh, and all of these sentences will appear on your quiz. That's why I have it in bold like this or different color. Walking on the sidewalk, a car raced by. Does your car walk on a sidewalk? You have a very strange car if it did. So walking on the sidewalk, here you have a dangling modifier. So it should be, while I was walking on the sidewalk, a car raced by. Or I was walking on, on the sidewalk when a car raced by. Either way is correct. But you have to say I. So it's missing um, your subject. While working, while working, an earthquake shook the building. Does your earth, does the earthquake have a job and it's going to shake the building while having a job? No. So while I was working, or I was working when the earthquake shook the building. So this is also a dangling modifier because it's missing a subject. Having finished the assignment, the TV was turned on. So your TV finished an assignment and turned itself on? No. Mm -hmm. So here you have to say, after I finished my assignment, I turned on the TV. Then it's correct. Because then you have a complex sentence, and you, so it's missing the subject. Do you get it, Kelly, Sarah, Sam? Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, another another way, way that you can, I'm, I'm wondering if there's another, another way you could say it is, having, having finished the assignment, I then turned on the TV. Yes. Like, does that work well? Yes. Okay. And then it's next to the, 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 the modifier. modifier. Yes, always the modifier has to be next to. So the modifier meaning the adjective clause. While I while, while finishing the assignment, that is an adjective clause that describes a person. Okay, having arrived late, a written excuse was needed. So did your piece of paper grow legs and grow arms and write itself an excuse? No. And did it arrive late? So it should be after I arrived late. A written to class, a written excuse to my teacher was needed. So we're missing a lot of parts to this sentence. So this sentence makes no sense by itself, so that makes it a, a, a dangling modifier. Everybody get that one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference, notice how I didn't have to really change the sentence. In a dangling modifier, it's simply missing something, so I want to add to the sentence to make it correct. But in a um, in a misplaced modifier, you have the same sentence, but you want to change it around. You actually move parts of the sentence in order to make it correct. Here, I really didn't move parts of the sentence. I simply added while I finished the assignment. When I arrived late. So I didn't really move anything. I added things to make it make sense. Whereas a misplaced modifier occurs when a modifier is placed incorrectly in the sentence. Here the modifier is simply missing. And here the modifier is already in the sentence, just needs to be placed correctly. So I'll give you an example. The patient was referred to a therapist with severe problems. So does, are you going to take your patient to a, thera to a crazy therapist? Hopefully not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here you have therapist with severe problems is the adjective phrase. And so this is the mo this is this the modifier uh, therapist the, mo the modifier with severe problems. Where should it go? Where should I replace with severe problems to make this sentence make sense? Correct. The patient with severe psychological problems was referred to a therapist. So I had to move with severe. Actually, this should say psychological. Oh well, P S. That was wrong. P S. Uh, C H O. Yeah, that's it. So the, the therapist. So with severe psychological problems, needs to, this modifier has to be changed or moved. So the patient with severe psychological problems, and now this is known as a misplaced modifier because I had to move the modifier next to what it modifies, which is the patient. The new employee will take the front office wearing the brown suit. So your front office wears a brown suit? Apparently not. So it's the new employee 
wearing the brown suit will take the front office. So I had to change this in order for it to make sense. So that's known as a misplaced modifier. My uncle just watches one television station. Um, here, just should be moved to my uncle watches just one television station. So this is a misplaced modifier because just does not modify uncle, it modifies television station. Okay, in other words, only one television station, not just only one uncle. Okay, we have many uncles, we don't just have one uncle. Uh, so here, my uncle watches, so the just modifies one television station, not your uncle. So that's, that's incorrect. I will be on the phone making appointments today. So is your phone making appointments for you? No. No. So here you would be saying, I will be making appointments on the phone today. That's how you would fix that sentence. On her way home, Jan found a gold man's watch. So here is the, is the man made of gold or is the watch made of gold? A lot. Yeah, so the, on her way home, Jan found a man's gold watch. Unless you're in James Bond, there really was a gold man who was the, um, you know, the, the criminal and he was gold. Um, the torn student's book lay on this desk. So here you would say the student's torn book lay on the desk. That's the last one for uh, misplaced modifiers. And that's it. Everybody get it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Okay. So uh, this is just a, oh, so the last part of this is sentence fragments. Sentence fragments are missing parts of the sentence, like, like if the sentence is missing a subject, verb, or complete thought. Kind of, kind of like the dangling modifiers, we're missing the subject. A sentence fragment is an incomplete sentence. A sentence fragment does not express a complete thought. A dependent clause not attached to an independent clause is a sentence fragment. So broke the glass, that's the subject missing. So the dog broke the glass, so that's correct. Mr. and Mrs. Smith is a fragment, but it's missing the predicate. So if you add in the predicate, Mr. and Mrs. Smith are old people, then it's correct. So here are more examples, not of sentence fragments not to a co-worker or secretary. It's not a complete thought, so it's a fragment. And not sound like a faker is a fragment. It's not a complete thought. When he is fat is not a complete thought. And although she sings is a dependent clause, it's not a complete thought. If a person talks to a co-worker who doesn't like him or her, that is also a sentence fragment. And the reason why I have it in color is those are the exact um, Think the exact sentences are going to be on your quiz. They're going to ask you, is this a fragment or a complete sentence? And then you're going to write A or B, fragment or complete sentence, and then it's A, fragment. That's how it's going to look on your quiz. And then run-on sentences. A run-on sentence is two or more sentences written as one. So if you have two sentences but no, 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 but no, no period, and you just say, Robert eats steak, he, he, likes to go, he likes to sleep after dinner or something, and you have no comma and no period, then you have two sentences that run together. That's called a run-on sentence. If I say, Robert eats steak, comma, Robert, uh, yep, yeah, uh, no, 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 Robert eats steak, Mary eats salad, then you put a comma there, that's a comma splice, because you're putting a comma there unnecessarily, okay? Because, so the way to fix it is you have to have a comma or a conjunction or you put a period. So here you have, John ate dinner, he went to the restaurant. That's a run-on sentence, and that's a comma slice, because here you're using the comma unnecessarily. So correct would be John ate dinner, comma, and he went to the restaurant. Or John ate dinner, period, he went to the restaurant. And John who ate dinner, uh, there shouldn't be a, John who ate dinner went to the restaurant. So those three are the correct ways. This, however, is a comma splice. So, Sarah, why is the, what, what is a comma splice? You're on mute. Um, it's, it's when a sentence or when two sentences are, are have a comma put in between them like I didn't previously. 
Yeah, and what is the difference between a comma splice and a run-on sentence, Sam? They don't, they they don't have that comma there? there? Yeah, so a run-on sentence is, that would be a fused, yeah, that's correct. So both, run, a run-on sentence is both a comma splice and a fused sentence, okay? So a run-on sentence simply means two sentences that are, 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 are put together with wrong punctuation, okay? They don't have the correct punctuation. That's all run-on sentences because they run into each other. You've got two kinds of run-on sentences, a comma splice. That's when you use an unnecessary comma between two sentences, and a fused sentence means that someone forgot to put a period after their sentence. So that's the difference. A comma splice means an unnecessary comma, and a fused sentence just means two sentences written together with no periods. So when you have no period after the two sentences, John ate dinner when he John ate dinner, he went to the restaurant. John ate dinner, he so here a fused sentence is a sentence with no comma, and a comma splice is when you have an unnecessary comma between two sentences. So then this is correct. John ate dinner, period, he went to the restaurant. John who ate dinner. What is wrong with this sentence? John, John who ate dinner. There's actually a mistake in it. The, the who ate dinner needs to be set, set off with commas. commas. Yes, so this, this was, I think originally I did have two commas, but I probably was doing an exercise with students saying, how can I, and then I forgot to put it back in for the next set of students. John who went to the restaurant ate, di ate dinner. What's wrong with this sentence? Take, 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 take the the commas. Yeah, you're missing, we're missing the commas. But if, if I say that, uh, uh, well, if, I, if, if this came after, at the end, John ate dinner, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be right. Anyway, so here are some more comma splice examples from your quiz. The can of mushroom soup must have spoiled. It was bulging at the top. And so here, this is a comma splice, and you, it needs a period. So if I were to put a period there, suddenly that little, oops, suddenly that little wiggly line, which is your Microsoft grammar check, suddenly that disappears. That's how you check it if you, what else is wrong with this sentence? There's still another punctuation mistake if I wanted to fix this. What other well, punctuation? It needs to be capitalized. Yes, it needs to be capitalized. And so if I wanted to correct it, now it's no longer a run-on sentence. Now it's no longer a, a comma splice and it's no longer a fused sentence. Now it's two correct, simple sentences. And how would I connect these two sentences together if I wanted to connect two simple sentences that have the same subject? Comma? comma? No. The can, am, I, am I calling? No, we're not talking punctuation. We're talking uh, how would I connect these two sentences so I don't have two simple sentences so that my my essay doesn't sound so choppy. It, 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 the can of oh. mushroom soup. So instead because of... Because the can of mushroom, can of mushroom soup, soup was bulging, bulging on top, on top comma, comma, it, it must have been, been, it must have spoiled. spoiled. Yes, yes, you can, you can put it together as a complex sentence or the can of uh, mushroom soup, which was bulging at the top, must have spoiled. So you can use an adjective clause relative clause, whatever you want to call it, the who, which, and that, to put the two sentences together to make your, um, to make your, your, your essay have sentence variety. So when I tell a student, you need to have more sentence variety, please don't have simple, 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 simple sentences in your essay, that's what I'm talking about, okay? And also, you got to have correct punctuation. So those are the two things, sentence variety and because that, that's on your rubric, they grade you for if you have if you lack sentence variety, I think that's like 20 or 30 points or something like that. Anyway, so the can of mushroom soup, so that's this is a comma splice, and then this is correct. I respect my parents. I resent their attempts to choose a career for me. Here you have a comma splice. A fused sentence. The most popular language in the world is Chinese. More than a billion people speak it. This is a fused sentence because here you have the most popular language in the world is Chinese, and then you have to put a comma here, and then you have to put more than a billion people speak it, or something like that. So I gotta put it back, I gotta put it back for the next bunch of students. Oops, let me see, M, O. Yeah, George knew the answer to the last essay question. He didn't have enough time to write his response. And so here you're missing a comma. Uh, you're missing a, what am I missing? 
What punctuation mark? Comma. Comma. Okay, if I put a comma here, then what am I missing? Well, I wonder why that didn't that didn't print. I put a comma there, and it didn't print. Hold on. Okay, and what else do I need? What did you say but beforehand? You didn't hear the answer, but you didn't have an answer. Correct. Now is a correct sentence because then it becomes a compound sentence. So right now i got to make it so it becomes a fused sentence. All right, so which sentence demonstrates a possessive subject? So use apostrophe S to show ownership. The China doll's dress was a sunny yellow. So the China doll's dress uh, is a subject, a possessive subject, uh, is a possessive subject. And then here, if uh, Jack's hat is a possessive subject, Susan's shoes are is a possessive subject. And we don't say the coats. We actually, this is from week one, I think. Vaguely mm -hmm. remember this, yeah. So here, that's a difference between, so apostrophes show, apostrophe S show contractions. He is a handsome man. And then a possessive object, I live in Darren's house. Do you believe that cooking is a woman's work? So an object comes after the verb, while a subject comes before the verb. So possessive subject comes before the verb, and possessive object comes after the verb. Okay, we're done. Now let's go to the fun part. You like this part, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I bet you all get 100%. So um, <laughs> the new employee will take the front office wearing the brown suit. What kind of error is in this sentence? Is it a dangling modifier, a misplaced modifier, or no error? We already know it's not C. So which one is it, A or B? B. B. The new employee. No, we're not missing the subject. The subject is the new employee. So try again. Because mis dangling modifier means that we're missing a sub the subject to the sentence. Oh, it's, oh, it's a misplaced B. Yeah. Yeah, it's misplaced. It's misplaced modifier because we have to, to, to whenever you have to, uh, this is misplaced. That's how you remember it. It's that, oh, this is the modifier and it's misplaced. It needs to be placed next to what it modifies. So the new employee wearing the brown suit. So that's how you can tell. Misplaced modifier means you got to move it around to put it in the right place. So that's how you remember it. I can't seem to find the keys. This is the first time you weren't late. If you aren't going to make it, please call. Choose the right sentence. C, C. Correct. And not sound like a faker. Is this a complete sentence or a fragment? It's a fragment. Uh, which sentence below is correct? At the age of four, my dad taught me to ride a bike. When I was four, my dad taught me to ride a bike. What? Did someone no, say? No, no. <coughs> when, when I was four, four yes. my dad taught me. Because your father was not four years old, at the age of four would modify my dad. So your father was not four years old when he taught you to ride your bike. So it's when I was four, my dad taught me to ride a bike. The most popular language in the world is Chinese. More than a billion people uh, speak it. Is this a complete sentence or a run-on? Run-on. Run it's a run-on. Which sentence is correct? Linda took her daughter to the doctor who has a high fever, or Linda's Linda took her daughter, who has a high fever, to the doctor. B. 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 Yeah. What kind of, is this a misplaced modifier or a dangling modifier? Misplaced. Mis misplaced. You got it. My uncle just watches one television station. What kind of error is in this sentence? Is it a dangling modifier, misplaced modifier, or no error? We already know it's not C. So what's A? Is it A or B? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think I heard someone say the right answer. It's louder. What did you say? B. B, yes. Because we have to move just. My uncle watches just one television station. So if we have to move the modifier around to make it a correct sentence, then it becomes a misplaced modifier. Is this a complete sentence or a run-on? George knew the answer to the last essay exam. He didn't have enough time to write his response. Run on. Run, on. Run on. Walking on the sidewalk, a car raced by. 
Is that a dangling modifier or a misplaced modifier? It's dangling yeah. because it's missing while I was walking on the sidewalk. First of all, one must be sure to speak directly to the boss. Is this a complete sentence or a fragment? It's a complete sentence. While working, while working, an earthquake shook the building. Is this a dangling modifier or a misplaced modifier? Dangling. 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 Yes. If a person talks to a coworker who doesn't like him or her, is this a complete sentence or a fragment? It's a fragment. It's a fragment. Not to a coworker or secretary. Is that a complete sentence or a fragment? A fragment, yes. You got it, Sam? Yeah. yeah. Because I'll, keep, I'll keep studying in it. The can of mushroom soup must have spoiled. It was bulging at the top. Is it a complete sentence or a run on? Run on. Run on. Run on, yes. And then here, uh, modifiers are words that, is it A, B, or C? Is, is it offers details and descriptions about an object? Should be placed as far away from the object as possible or should be deleted from the sentence? What are modifiers? A. A. A, yes. So that offers details like blue shirt. So it offers a description of the object. George knew the, the answer to the last essay exam. He didn't have enough time to write his response. So is this a complete sentence or a run on? Run on. Run on. Run on. Does the following sentence contain a misplaced modifier or a dangling modifier? I will be on the phone making appointments today. Misplaced. 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 You get it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about 18? I respect my parents. I resent their attempts to choose a career for me. Is that a complete sentence or a run on? Run on. Run on because you need to put a period over here. And then here you can retake the quiz, and this has all of the right answers, and you should get a, a good grade on your, uh, on your quiz. So here I have the writing process where you have pre-writing. So for your uh, essay two, pre-writing is going to be week seven, where you're going to choose a topic, and you're going to write a thesis statement and an outline to your comparison contrast essay. Week eight, you're going to write a rough draft. Week 11 and 12, you're going to rewrite and revise. Okay, so 7, 8, 11, 12. This is what, where we started uh, from when, we, when I did this. So pre-writing, writing, week 2, 4, and 5, and then week 9 and 10, you're going to do something else. Is everything, everybody good on their week 6 assignment, your midterm? Yeah, everybody should already know that. So I'm just going to go right into what is a comparison contrast essay? A comparison contrast essay is when you compare two things. And so here I have um, Los Angeles is a better place to live than New York because Los Angeles has better beaches, monuments, and food. So then you would have um, why is Los Angeles a great place to live? Because Los Angeles has good beaches, it has good monuments, and it has good food. So here the three reasons in your thesis statement will then match the three topic sentences in your body paragraphs. This is known as the alternate method of your uh, comparison contrast uh, essay. And then uh, if you want, and we're going to, for this, when we use simple subjects like New York versus Los Angeles, um, movies versus books, um, childhood versus adulthood, all of these are very simple, dogs versus cats, all of these are very simple subjects. Therefore, you cannot just simply write an essay where you would say, uh, dogs are different from cats because dogs bark, but cats have a meow. The reason being is that everybody knows that, a dog, that dogs bark and everybody knows that cats meow. So we don't want to write a straight comparison. Uh, we want to we write which one is our preference. That's what makes it, especially if you have simple subjects like that, then you, we don't do the straight comparison. We only do the straight comparison is if you have two very complicated subjects, like COVID-19 is worse than the average flu. Okay, then you have two complicated subjects, 
then you can make a straight comparison of COVID-19 is a symptomatic illness that has this, this, this. Then you can get very medical. And then the flu also, but it differentiates from the, from, uh, and then you can get very medical and complicated and you can have that. Then you can do a straight comparison, okay? That's called a factual thesis statement versus an evaluative thesis statement. So what we're going to do is we're not we're going to avoid if, if you choose a simple topic then you're going to use the evaluative thesis statement which is you tell me your preference something is better than worse than or as good as okay so if you choose a simple subject then you use the preference evaluative thesis statement if you choose a harder topic like the difference between um, I can't remember there were two different kinds of records that nurses keep and I can't remember what they were. Then, oh, then oh, there's the like the M bar and the F bar. Yeah, like then you can do a straight comparison. In other words, we do a straight comparison to tell people what they don't really know about. Okay, the difference between global warming and climate change. There actually is a difference. Somebody wrote about that. So when it's when it's an unknown, uncommon knowledge people don't know about, then you can use a straight out factual um, thesis statement. But if you write a, 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 a dogs versus cats like I did, then it's so boring because everybody knows the difference between a dog and a cat. And then what makes your essay interesting would be simply what is your preference? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. basically. So like yeah. If you wanted yeah. to yeah. write about yeah. dogs and cats, you'd say why I prefer yes. one yeah, over the right. other rather than what's, what's the, difference? the difference. Yes. So that's what that's, 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 you that's want that written in. Huh? What, what tense do you want that? Like third person, person, first person? Oh, yeah, you should, you should try writing it. Uh, because your second essay will require APA, then you should do it in third person case. Yeah. You could also say, without, without saying I, 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 without even saying Yvonne Ho likes dogs versus cats, just simply say dogs are better than cats. You don't even have to put yourself into for a comparison contrast essay. You could just say dogs are better than cats because dogs are more affectionate. Dogs show more um, whatever it is. Okay, so you're informing um, the reader your preference by saying dogs are better than cats. You're informing the reader of your preference, and then you and then you you make a claim and then you back it up with credible evidence. So you're going to have you, you're, in your second essay, you're going to have to back that up with statistics or something that you research. That's how it differs from a narrative essay where it's more based on, and I, it, for the narrative essay, I could have let you use first person case, but I wanted you to all practice third person case so that you would be ready to, it would be so much easier to write for your second essay. Okay, that was the reason why I did it that way. Anyway, so I go over the difference between an explanatory thesis, which is a factual thesis, versus an evaluative thesis. But while both wind and turbine and wind turbines and solar panels have their own shortcomings, both offer a number of advantages over traditional energy sources. Carbohydrate free and whole grain diet experts agree on one thing. Limiting Refined sugar is the key to weight loss. The Civil War would, have, would, have, would be said to have arisen from a fundamental dispute over freedom. Which is more sacred, freedom for individuals or freedom from government? So here you have some examples of explanatory, explanatory as in factual, and just like you would write about the different kinds of uh, charts that nurses use, which I can't even remember what that was that somebody wrote about. And then, um, but in both cases, your thesis statement needs to be debatable. In other words, something that, um, something that we can agree or disagree on. Because when you have a debatable thesis statement, that makes it much more, makes your essay much more interesting. So you could choose from these topics, which is in your, or you could choose from all of these topics for your, uh, you know, your, your essay. And then you have alternate. Okay, so the alternate method, before I showed you, oh, I already did the alternate method, oh, the block method. Okay, the block method is when you write one paragraph about New York and one paragraph about California. So if I say Los Angeles is a better place to live than New York because of the fantastic beaches, Mexican food, and movie studios, then I would write one paragraph about New York, and then you write about beaches, Mexican food, and culture. Then you write another paragraph on California, and you write it in the same order, 
beaches, Mexican food, and culture. It has to be five to seven sentences. Now for people who don't talk too much and can be very concise, then I recommend the block method. If you tend to blah, 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 blah a lot, then I'd recommend the alternate method. Because in the alternate method, you can write five to seven sentences just about uh, beaches. Whereas here, you have to squeeze beaches into two sentences, two sentences, and two sentences. So that's how come mm -hmm. I say, if you tend to be yakky, 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 then you do, do it this way. And if you tend to be very short, like winded or whatever, you use the block method. And I think another way of calling the alternate method is point by point. And so this is from your, your, your textbook. Home-cooked hamburgers are better than fast food burgers because of the taste, nutrition, and price. And so this becomes the alternate method. And then I think this is the block method. So I'll let you read through that. And that's also in your... And the next week, um, I guess I'm going to be doing... Yeah, I'll be doing this. So in week... I think it's week eight that I will be doing transition words. So this is, this is out of date. Um, and so for your next, next one, week six... This is week six week seven well anyway that's the end of this mm -hmm. particular that's the end of this particular um i try to oh, make no, I, I try to make the writing section short because everyone is so tired from quizzes after the practice quiz this is how people look <laughs> you know because you're, you're you want to get straight to the quiz okay and, and, then, and then by that time, everybody's too tired to listen to what the, what the writing is about. So, and then everybody does the week seven forum incorrectly because of that. So that happens. Anyway, so uh, you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so what's the, so what's the alternate method is five paragraphs. Paragraph. Yes, block, the block correct. Method is four, and your conclusion in the block paragraph, paragraph is which one, which is, one is better, basically. Um, the, the both, they both compare two things. But the block method, you have, um, in other words, you just write about, you write about one topic, you write about New York, and then you write all three reasons. Then you write about, you know, Los Angeles, and you write all three reasons, all in, all in one paragraph. Whereas in the alternate method, you're still comparing the two, but then you're writing the three reasons, and you spend each one. Did I go through the comparison contrast too fast? No, no, I'm just making sure that, like, the amount of paragraphs. Oh, right, right, right. So if you're doing the block method, you end up with four paragraphs. And if you're doing the alternate method, you end up with five paragraphs. Was that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so any other, any other, and you got to make sure that if you, if you can fit um, five to seven sentences into your three reasons, into one paragraph, then you could use the block method. Otherwise, what, what happens is people end up with humongous, too long paragraphs. I had a student have it. One whole page was about New York. The other whole page was about, but you said I could put all three reasons into one paragraph. I go, yeah, but you got to squeeze it into five or seven sentences. You don't just write a whole, you know, long thing. Otherwise, you should have just used the other one if, you, if you're so yakety yakety, you know, um, talkative. So I, I write the way I talk. So for me, the alternate method is the better one. Um, because I talk too much. So anyway, any other questions? No? Okay. So I'll see you all next week, and I hope you guys all have a fun week and get all good grades on your week seven last quiz. Okay? All right. See you guys. Thank you.